Fighting behemoth ocean battleships. Your adrenaline is just pumped to the mass. Battling speed demon alpha predators. Oh my god, look at this huge fin. I thought it was a whale. Stalking venomous hidden hunters. It's almost like stepping on a venomous mouse trap, like springing a booby trap. And the ultimate showdown, Whopper versus U.S. President. How is fishing like politics? It's not, I, th I suppose you might say the day you win an election, it's like catching a 135-pound tarpon. For science, sport, and food, it's the most extreme encounters in our eternal quest for hooked monster fish. Woo! Ah! Mammoth whoppers rule our waters. In these murky depths, we are just visitors. Yet we're driven to uncover them, understand them, and take them on. Ah! Backbreaking battles, <coughs> tough tests of endurance, colossal contests of skill and will. On the front lines of man versus beast, we, we challenge and we celebrate the world's mightiest monster fish. In the world of Whoppers, they're a killer combo. Part fearsome hunter, part turbocharged torpedo. The Mako Shark. It's, it's really the speed demon of the ocean. These powerful double threats are the fastest sharks on Earth, with speeds exceeding 48 kilometers an hour. No other shark combines such breakneck speed with such fierce killing power. It all makes the Mako one of the ocean's most ferocious and deadly predators. It's not simply the fact that it can get fast. It gets fast quickly. It's the acceleration. It really doesn't compare to any other shark species. Just that burst from a gliding maybe four or five miles an hour to 20, before you can see it, it just leaves a trail of bubbles. And fast-moving Makos reach titanic sizes. Record setters have weighed nearly 700 kilos, while many more top the scales at over 450 kilos. To carry such mammoth girth, their cartilage-based bodies can stretch over three and a half meters, and strong sickle-shaped tails power their mass like missiles. It's the almost like kicking in the turbo on a high-performance sports car or a motorcycle. The Mako shark is pretty much from here to there to its prey item in just a moment, a few flicks of that well-designed tail. Though violent attacks on people are rare, when provoked or threatened, Makos will strike. Experienced anglers know, tangle with a Mako, it's at your own risk. They are the king of the ocean. They rule. Um, they're not afraid of anyone, and they are tenacious. July 15, 2006. A Mako shark fishing tournament in the Channel Islands off the coast of Southern California. Avid angler Marilyn Stevens and a seasoned crew set out hoping to catch the day's winning whopper. Reaching the open ocean, the crew drops some tempting shark bait, a punctured bucket filled with fish guts. Okay guys, chum's over, chum's going in. Some sharks can smell blood in the water at an astounding one part per million. That's the equivalent of detecting a few drops of blood in an Olympic-sized swimming pool. The crew watches and waits. Suddenly, a hundred yards from the boat, they spot a fin. It's so big, they're not sure what species they've lured. We all screamed and yelled and carried on and said, oh my God, look at this huge fin. I thought actually it was a whale. Marilyn's determined to find out. But before she can get closer, the fin disappears. 
turning around. He's not coming back in. Look. Marilyn fears she's lost the catch. But a few hours later, it's back. There was that fin again. Now only about 30 yards out from the boat. Up close, there's no doubt. It's a mighty Mako. The crew casts a baited line towards the fish, but the fin disappears once more. With the clock ticking, Marilyn's hopes for the tournament trophy disappear with it. He's not taking it yet. Then, without warning, she feels an arm ripping heave on her line. Oh, man! Oh! It was a very, very different experience than I've ever had. The tug was incredibly powerful. With the reel spinning fast, it's hard to stay calm. But Marilyn knows, against a Mako, she needs a strategy. To hook it, she's got to let the shark grab the bait and run. I kept thinking was, be careful, be careful, be careful, because if I don't hook it, if he doesn't take the bait, if I don't set it correctly, I'm going to miss this one glorious opportunity. The angler yanks the fishing line in several strong bursts, gripping the rod with both hands. At last, Marilyn's done it. The Mako's hooked. Now she has to hang on to a wild beast. Go ahead sideways. That's it. Step over. Okay, you got it. You got it. The Mako sails above the water, doing flips. As soon as I set that hook, he just came leaping out of the ocean, did that backflip, did it twice, and that was that was spectacular. Wow! Oh my God! Backflip! Oh my God! Then, Marilyn's worst fear. The hunted becomes the hunter. The Mako changes direction, headed straight towards the boat. Johnny, charge in the boat. Let's move it. Hit it. Mako shark are fast, and they have been known to um, actually jump in boats. And so, <laughs> whenever you have a Mako shark charging at the boat <laughs> and literally, you know, coming towards you, um, that is a, a major concern. Hit it. Hit it. Reacting fast. The crew tries to keep the boat ahead of the shark. But the speeding Mako has its own plan. Immediately, it hits the surface and starts rolling on the line, spinning like a top. I've never seen a Mako do that before. That was a very, very dangerous part of the capture because they'll do that in an effort to try and break the line. Johnny, he's going out. We need to back down. That's it. Go, 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 go. To give the line some slack, the crew backs up. But the rolling Mako suddenly dives under. Fish and boat are locked in a battle of wills. He's taking line. I'm trying to get some line back. He's taking more line. I'm trying to take line back. And there's a, there's a tug of war going on at that point. The tug of war rages for a grueling two hours. Marilyn's worn out and worried she's losing the catch. Good job, Marilyn. Good job. Then, with a muscle burning pull, she gets enough line to pull the Mako up, holding it at the surface. It's Titanic, even bigger than anyone expected. Oh my God, that is a big Mako. We knew it was the largest mako shark we had ever found. It's scary um, to see that size of a fish that close to you with his mouth wide open. I would say that there was definitely a fear factor there. It's a daunting challenge. To reel a snapping shark to a boat takes courage and skill. Hey guys, I got leader. I got leader. Come on guys. Come on guys. Yes, ready. Moving fast, the team pulls the shark in. Rope tying its tail and snout. At last, after putting their tournament fishing skills to the ultimate test, they've got the Whopper Mako caught. We got it! We got it! 
Back on shore, game officials are stunned. It's a grander plus. Tipping the scales at over 770 kilos. Stretching more than three meters. Oh, man. Marilyn takes the tournament and shatters the record for the largest mako ever caught by a female angler. The team donates enough shark meat to make 2,000 meals for the homeless. But today, as a species, makos face growing threats. Alarming evidence shows a double danger. Makos are getting smaller on two fronts, numbers and growth. Smaller sizes and populations are driving biologists to investigate. Many believe one of the gravest threats to the makos comes down to a lethal element, mercury. We find that mercury levels, mercury, the atmospheric mercury that falls into the ocean and again works its way up the food chain to these top predators like the, like the mako shark, mercury levels are building in their tissues. Frequently, the bigger the fish, the higher the mercury level. Also known as quicksilver, mercury's a heavy metal, a powerful pollutant that gets into the air and water. Big fish like makos live long, eating a steady diet of mercury-carrying prey. Over time, the whopper fish becomes dangerously unhealthy, stunted, and toxic. Worldwide efforts to clean up mercury are helping monitoring metal manufacturing and curbing mercury-based products. All giving monster fish like the mako a chance to reach truly monster proportions. Among the planet's mightiest whoppers, hulking and huge, they glide through the water like behemoth battleships. The Goliath Grouper. Goliath groupers live up to their name. Colossal cousins to the sea bass, Goliaths are the West Atlantic's largest groupers. These whoppers grow as long as surfboards. Record Goliaths have topped the scales at nearly 700 kilos, stretching almost two and a half meters. These guys are like swimming foam booths sometimes. They're just huge. The Goliath's supersize is a monster survival advantage. Powered by hunting instincts, giant Goliaths are fiercely territorial and hungry. Fish, shellfish, and even sea turtles who swim into Goliath turf fast become food. And as for predators, Goliaths get so big they outsize hunting barracudas and sharks. Only the largest predator even attempts a Goliath kill. For anglers, tackling a Goliath grouper's a tough test, fighting a mammoth fish that won't quit. December 11, 2004. Fishing Mecca, San Carlos Bay, Florida. Professional fishing guides Nelson Diaz and Ben Chansey set out together with only one species in mind, Goliath grouper. <laughs> and the men know there's only one place to go. The Sanibel Causeway Bridge, Goliath stomping ground. Here, these territorial fish take advantage of concrete pylons, ideal cover for ambushing prey. Soon after the bait hits the water, the angler feels a tug so powerful, it almost pulls him overboard. Nelson's convinced. 
only a Goliath can pull so hard, so fast. When you first get the hit, they just, it's just a pull. It breaks, it's really, your, your body is just going, like, I can't do this anymore. You know, you're just stressed out. Anchoring his feet against the railing, bearing down on the rod, Nelson tries to stay put, but he's losing ground fast. Come on, Cap, come on, come on, Cap. Come on, you can do it, you can do it. Something's gonna break, you're gonna get pulled into the water. Don't let him over there, stop, stop, stop. The angler pulls on the reel hard as he can. The Goliath won't budge. It's a risky situation. Any moment, the line could snap from rubbing against the ragged concrete block. You have to get the fish out. If you don't get the fish out of the structure, they're going to break you off. Nelson refuses to quit. He's convinced he just has to get the boat and the fish further away from the bridge. But as the anglers navigate past the pylons, the strategy to lure the fish from its hiding place works too well. The Goliath follows them and keeps going, swimming all the way under the boat. Now, to stay hooked, Nelson has to do fishing gymnastics. As the line strains under the whopper's weight, the fisherman gathers his strength and gives a yank. It takes an epic struggle, but he's got it. Nelson pulls the Goliath to the surface. It's huge. Yet a new battle's just begun. The fishermen want to measure the monster specimen alive, but the monster has no intention of giving in. The Goliath thrashes and slaps. Using an instrument called a boca grip, the angler corrals the fighting fish. Nelson grabs hold of a fleshy lip. I just grabbed his lip, and it was really like, that was his lip. And it was like grabbing like, a big two by four or something. Pulling the grouper into the boat at last. And once we slid him in the boat, you could actually really see how big he was. It was amazing. The measurements are jaw dropping. Over two meters long and nearly two meters around, plus an estimated 300 kilos. Before releasing it back into the water, home video footage captures the catch of a career. Just couldn't wait to get pictures, and you know, because that was my biggest fish, you know, I ever caught there. Here she goes. Yet this supersized species is fighting for its survival. Goliath groupers are considered critically endangered. What does such a dangerous designation mean? For an animal to change its status, we can look at population density. So not just simply the number of animals, but their distribution. Before extinction, there are four alarming rungs on the preservation ladder. International organizations calculate factors like total population, rates of decline, and habitat threats. Once a species is in trouble, it graduates from near-threatened to vulnerable from vulnerable to endangered, and then to the worst scenario, critically endangered. Efforts like fishing bans to save the Goliath have helped the species start to rebound. The ultimate goal? Goliaths reaching the bottom rung of conservation, least concern. Among the world's biggest monster fish, some are more than just huge. They're lethal. These masters of camouflage can kill with the flick of a whip. The stingray. You may not even see it there. And if you do see it, probably the last thing you're going to think is, this animal's going to be dangerous. And then, bam, you've been popped, just like that. Stingrays are a gargantuan group. 70 race species inhabit the planet. Diverse race species may be members of different fish families, but many share classic ray traits. And among them all, 
The biggest whoppers are the manta rays, weighing nearly 1,400 kilos with wingspans long as 9 meters. And mantas aren't the only monsters. Short tail rays can easily weigh over 300 kilos. And with a nearly 2 meter length, their total surface area can add up to 4 square meters, big as an office cubicle. Bottom skimming rays are passive feeders with an edge. Some rays filter plankton and small fish, shellfish or krill into their downturned jaws. But when they want more, they can turn their mouths into vacuum cleaners, sucking up prey hidden under the sand. Rays can also keep their heads and bodies virtually buried in sand without suffocating. They feed off the bottom, but they actually breathe through the top. Two big holes on the top of their body, sort of our nostrils went right around to the back of our head so that we can inhale through, or we can inhale through there and blow it out through our mouth. And when threatened, with the flick of a tail whip, a stingray becomes an assassin. Jagged tail barbs connect to a venom gland near the base of the spine. As the tail makes contact, the barb embeds or shreds the unlucky victim, causing searing pain or worse. Piercing arteries, even bone, causing toxic shock and sometimes death. It's almost like combination of having a whip on the back that you can kind of like Zora, you could crack it at your enemies like that, but the tip of it, the tip of it actually is safe. It all adds up to a powerful monster fish. For fishermen who take them on, a whopper stingray is a tough test of strength. The smallest stingray in the world will give you one heck of a fight when you're trying to pull something through the water that's shaped like an airplane. August 10th, 2007, Chesapeake Bay Bridge Tunnel, Virginia. On a mission to catch a whopper, avid angler Jason Bell stakes out a prime spot on the nearly 200 meter long Seagull Pier, a fishing hotspot projecting anglers far out and nine meters above the bay. Scanning the waters, Jason casts his baited line. Setting the line to free spool, the angler props the fishing rod against the pier's railing and briefly turns away. Suddenly, the reel starts to wail. Gripping the rod tight as he can, Jason's never felt a drag this strong. Basically, it felt like I really hooked a submarine. The long fishing rod bends dangerously towards the water. At any moment, it could snap. All at once, the water's surface breaks. A dark mass moves and ripples below. The angler recognizes the shape, a whopper ray. I could see like a big old brown diamond shaped thing swimming on the water and instantly I knew it was a stingray. Jason gets a glimpse, but not enough to determine the fish's full size. The ray dives down deeper. The anglers worry the stingray might bury itself on the sandy bottom. If he would have ever got on the bottom, I would have never gotten him up. But the stingray has other plans. The fish pulls his line all the way under and out the other side of the pier, dangerously close to the cement pylons where the thin line could fray. In a desperate move, Jason locks the reel. It's a risky maneuver. The ray can't pull out any more line. But with the added tension, the thin filament is in greater danger of breaking. The fisherman holds tight. His arms are near the breaking point. Gathering his strength, Jason manages to reel the ray back to his side of the pier. Success! 
but it's only half the battle. The ray's still deep underwater. To get it to the surface, Jason has to hoist the flapping stingray straight up. It's tougher than lifting dead weight. When you're pulling a bucket through the water, it has a lot of water resistance just because of the sheer mass, the sheer size of the fish. After a backbreaking 60 minutes, Jason gets the whopper ray right to the surface with a powerful heave. He can't believe his eyes. It's even bigger than he imagined. But as he struggles to pull the ray out of the water, the angler realizes it's impossible. He needs more muscle, fast. He calls out to a bystander who rushes in to help, using a gaff and rope to hook the ray. Once it's gaffed, Jason throws down his rod. Together, the men fight a bloody tug of war, literally. As I was pulling up on the rope, it was cutting right through the palm of my hand just because it was so heavy. For this phenomenal fish, they're going to need even more brawn. Incredibly, it takes four men, eight arms, and many long minutes to hoist the ray. At last, they've done it. The men get the Leviathan onto the dock. Mission accomplished. It's a monster weighing 126 kilos. The stingrays nearly two meters across, stretching over one and a half meters long. As Jason's photo shows, it's bigger than a car's hood. A pending world record for the largest stingray caught on rod and reel. It's the biggest thing I've ever caught. It's fought me longer than anything I caught. Around the world, stingrays are often feared. Yet ironically, in the future, the same toxic trait that makes these fish so frightening may become their greatest asset to species protection, their venom. Stingray venom may have healing powers. Crossing the line from poison to potion may come down to quality versus quantity. Too much stingray venom can cause muscle contractions and seizures. But in the right doses, new research tests if the same poisonous protein can be used to treat serious illness. From dangerous to life-saving, further proof of the importance of protecting big fish like mighty, remarkable rays. In the world of whoppers, they're like long-distance submarines. And when it's time to hunt, this swimming fleet becomes a battalion, the northern bluefin tuna. They just swarm in and attack their prey, and the prey might just explode out of the water they move so quickly. Kilo for kilo, bluefin are some of the biggest fish to roam the open ocean. Whopper bluefin have tipped the scales at 680 kilos, stretching over four meters. But unlike most big fish, behemoth bluefin roam in packs. They're the largest bony fish to swim in schools. Unusual behavior for animals big enough to survive solo, yet it's extremely smart. Schooling creates a dense mass of shimmering bodies underwater, deterring predators like sharks, who find it much harder to penetrate and charge a shifting and fast-moving gang. They don't just have the advantage of strength and numbers, they have well, truly, they have stealth and intelligence in numbers to respect. And when it comes to the hunt, schooling bluefin become a deadly swarm, executing maneuvers en masse, attacking prey like a brigade. If bluefin had a killer's credo, it'd be all for one. They're really about the only schooling fish we know of that works cooperatively. They corral around almost like a football team. 
They all have a role to play, but they're all working towards the same goal, and that goal is getting dinner. For anglers, chasing down these schooling hunters can push even a pro to the edge of endurance. Once a bluefin tuna is actually on the line, look out, you're looking for quite a fight. June 24, 2007. Famous fishing hub, Virginia Beach, Virginia. Experienced angler Bo Haycox, his father and friends, set out on an expedition, hoping to catch a big marlin. Soon after dropping their lines, they spot a commotion on the port side. A whopping splash. There he is! They're Sean! Sean! The anglers realize it's a double whammy. Got it! All right, come on. All right. Simultaneously, two rods, Bo's and his father Rick's, bend down with a powerful tug. Each man's hooked a monster fish. There he is! Two rods just came down. Bam! At that moment, Rick's line suddenly breaks off in a snap. He's lost his whopper catch. Bo's determined not to lose his. What started as a two-man fight is now down to one. For maximum leverage, Bo quickly climbs into the fishing chair. His reel is screaming. By now, the fish has taken out so much line, Bo only has about 90 meters left. It's super-sized and strong. Let's go and get it! Let's go and get it! We knew it was a huge fish. It's probably about 300 yards away, so we didn't know quite what we had. One thing Bo does know, landing this fighting fish will take all the strength he's got. And there's nothing I could do but just hold on and let him go. The exhausting tug-of-war wears on. Bo bucks and strains in the fishing chair. Father Rick has a trick to make it easier for his son. He pours liquid soap onto the seat, allowing Bo to slide without getting stuck. But Bo's fish shows no sign of letting up. The angler's body's aching, yet he hangs on for an incredible three hours. Neither man nor beast is willing to give up. I didn't want to fight him anymore, but I wanted to get the fish. Bo's stamina is at the breaking point. He tries any strategy to increase pressure on his line. He puts a glove on his hand to clutch the reel without cutting his flesh. It's a battle, and, and it's you against the fish, and you want to win. Of course, he wants to win too. Then, after four backbreaking hours, Bo's determination pays off. There it is! Oh. The fish surfaces in a rush. Get ready. It's no marlin. It's a bluefin tuna. The biggest he's ever reeled in. When he came up to the surface, I mean, I think all of us were like, oh my gosh, this is a big fish. That's a big blue pin there. It takes all hands on deck to hoist the whopper on board. At last, they've got it. That's great. We got it. We got it? Right, yeah. right, this might be a new state record. Examining the tuna, they think it might be a record catch. The skipper grabs the radio and calls friends ashore, sharing the news. They've got a monster. Ended up being, they said, you got a hundred, however, a hundred inch fish, you, you got it. Great work, bro, good job! Woo! At the docks, a huge crowd's gathered. It takes ten men to lift the giant tuna. The mega catch stretches an astounding 2.7 meters long, weighs 259 kilos, and measures nearly two meters around. A record breaker. Virginia State's largest bluefin tuna catch. But what future do bluefin face? Around the world, commercial fishing and pollution are threatening bluefin survival. One solution may come down to a groundbreaking idea, 
turning this wild species into a healthy, sustainable crop. The challenges are immense. In order to reproduce sustainable species, you need to be able to spawn, gather, and fertilize their eggs for successful reproduction. But wild bluefin are considered extremely difficult to tame and breed. That is, until now. Though it's still challenging science, successful tuna farms in South Australia and Japan are leading the way to captive breeding. Intensive research has fueled critical innovations, including captive bluefin breeding from eggs. Scientists have safely captured wild bluefin and set up closely monitored sea cages that allow them to induce spawning, even creating usable eggs that may hatch under man-made conditions all part of protecting this endangered monster fish. In the most extreme fishing quests, some monster fish are among the most prized catches on Earth. The tarpon. Ancient survivors. Strong, tenacious. A tough test of skill and will. For one former U.S. president and an Olympic athlete, the ultimate battle of man versus whopper. This tarpon is just huge thrill because of his size and his majesty and the beauty. It was just great. Atlantic tarpon are prehistoric predators dating back 300 million years. Part of their epic survival comes down to mammoth proportions. Longer than bathtubs, whopper shimmery silver tarpon can stretch two and a half meters and weigh over 130 kilos. These are enormous fish. They're like escalates covered in chrome, just cruising through the shallows of the Gulf waters. And they're huge fighters, very strong fish. One advantage to growing huge is a mouth built like an armored trap. Tarpon jaws are connected at the throat by a bony plate and held together by ligaments and muscle. Their bony mouths literally work like snapping traps, helping tarpon catch, crush, and devour fast-moving prey with powerful force. But for anglers, penetrating these bony jaws is one of the biggest tests in sport fishing. Most hooks simply fall flat against these crushing maws. And if an angler's lucky enough to penetrate a chink in the tarpon's armor, he's in for a fight. Hang on. Famed anglers have taken on tarpon for generations. Herbert Hoover was a tarpon fishing fan. And in 1937, Franklin Delano Roosevelt and his boatmates reeled in an 80-pound Texas tarpon. And the latest leader to battle this formidable fish? See that breaking water out there? 41st President George Herbert Walker Bush is a self-described fishing fanatic, an avid angler for 80 years, a childhood passion that began here at his Kennebunkport, Maine home. Even anglers accustomed to dealing with affairs of state embrace fishing's conquests, R&R, and family bonding. And in our family, we do it with the different generations. That's my beloved daughter. That one is the President of the United States fishing with his father. But the thing I love about this one is it shows the shows that you do a lot of heft to get that lure out there. That'll show you two generations, enthusiasm of two generations of bushes. Did that bring a smile to your face? It sure did. I didn't want to lose him. Now. Like many anglers, Bush has favorite fishing buddies. <laughs> including Olympic downhill skier and tournament fisherman Andy Mill. You want to net this fish for me? If I lose it, don't blame the net man. <laughs> Together, they're veterans of adventure fishing around the world. Man. I got it. I'll, I'll okay. bring her over He'll to bring you. bring it around. Here we are in the Arctic Circle in frigid waters. Everybody's got hypothermia, ready to go in after about five hours, and President Bush is still out there in his waist, waist-deep water, cast a fly, determined to catch an Arctic char. The President's got a fish. The President's got a fish. <laughs> Oh, how fun is this? Glad to be of service. Call on me if you need me. April 19th, 2008, the Florida Keys. I hmm. think we're going to do very, very well. President Bush, Andy Mill, and boat captain George Wood set out for a tarpon fishing expedition. Prepping their rods, 
and bracing themselves for the fish's unique challenges. True to his mission, Bush insists on using fly gear. Sometimes you can throw right at them and they won't, they won't touch it. There you go. The anglers drop their baited lines, scanning the waters, looking for any movement. Come on, little man. The former president is battling an additional challenge, an injury. A recent back sprain keeps him seated. On board, buddy Andy Mill hides his concern. There you go, beautiful. In the back of my mind, I'm thinking, you know, it's hard for him to stand up on the deck of a boat. You're rocking in the water. You can't cast too far in the vis visibility. You got to be able to pick up and, and see these fish. And that's getting more and more difficult for him. But good, Bush yeah. is determined to land a monster. Yeah. That, that, that Suddenly, there's turmoil in the water, churning, changing tides, bringing in big fish. And the tide switch and all of a sudden the fish started appearing. And we knew, you know, the bombs were going to go off. And sure enough, here come the fish. Look at that, Andy. The men That's cast their it. rods into the fray. Captain, what is it? It's a wheel. <laughs> the skipper feels a sharp tug on his line. What the heck is oh. that? Fish on! The captain passes his reel to Andy Mill, who promptly passes it to the seated President Bush. There you go, George. Handing over what's Let about to become a, a titanic tug of war. The fish grabs hold of the bait and starts jumping. When agitated, tarpon can propel themselves several feet out of the water. <laughs> and then he jumps sky high. First of several jumps. He's got a hard mouth and he took it. We got him well hooked. And so it was just, just holding, keeping a strain on him. Oh, Seeing the tarpon fly through the air, everyone realizes it's a whopper. But I couldn't hardly believe it. But then I was worried about keeping him on the line, uh, keeping him hooked, and not, not letting him break away. You know, I don't think he realized how big this fish was until we got it up. And I think way down inside, he might have been a little bit intimidated. It takes tremendous strength to keep the bucking tarpon on the line. As the fight wears on, President Bush struggles through his injury, hoping the catch isn't literally backbreaking. More than once, he fears he's lost the tarpon. He keeps his eyes fixed on the whopper fish, cutting deep through the water, refusing to give up. And I thought it listen, but we, we fought him for 45 minutes. Yeah, in here. But it seemed like an hour. But soon, the tarpon begins to tire. Coming up for air in a second. The former president marshals the last of his strength and yanks back hard as he can on his line. All at once, he's got it. The fish surfaces at the edge of the boat. It's a super specimen. When we got that big fish up next to the boat, I was really, I had a lot of anxiety in the fact, uh, knowing the situation. And I'm begging, I'm praying with, her, you know, with everything I had that we could pull this fish into the lap of the president. Now the real challenge, getting the Whopper on board for a quick photo and a safe catch and release. It means hauling up a mass of wriggling muscle without injuring or losing the catch. Wasting no time, experienced George. Captain George Wood steps in. Success. That is the fish. I think maybe you've seen the picture of the two of us holding him, and then we just turned him loose and away he swam. Before letting it go, the seasoned team estimates the fish's length at almost two meters, almost one meter around, and a whopping 61 kilos. Even for a president with over eight decades of angling experience, the conquest was one of the highlights of his sport fishing career. These are these are some great flies. I haven't just haven't tried them, but I will. I'll be out there as soon as the fish get out there. How is fishing like politics? More mice. They get ridiculed if you break out the mouse pack. I suppose you might say the day you win an election is like catching a. 135 pound tarpon. I'll never forget it. Lifetime experience.
This was better than walking up Madison Avenue following Sophia Loren. Around the world, tarpon trophy fishing is facing a new frontier and attitude towards saving the fish competitors' catch. In the past, tarpon fishing tournaments were really trophy tournaments. Catch the fish, get it mounted, put it up on the wall. That's changed these days, and this is the trend of tarpon tournaments around the country. And it's not just tarpon. From bass to marlin to sharks, catch and release techniques and regulations are blazing new trails amongst tournament fishermen. On board, fish preserving cages called keep alive boxes, built in live wells, and careful weigh in techniques are all helping fishermen win trophies without fatally harming the species they hunt. You want these fish to move and uh, to be protected, so I'm, I'm a big fish and release man. The big, big guys you want to treat with respect. Colossal creatures. Titanic beasts that rule our waters with incredible power. Wherever and however we encounter them, for sport, study, or food, these apex predators and giant whoppers deserve our respect. So we can continue to treasure and take on the world's most astounding monster fish.